Okay, I hope on your notes you were able to answer the bellwork question about describe how you would go about identifying a fish on a beach that was washed up. Hopefully you said something about a dichotomous key, perhaps. If you did that, you probably are skirting at least around the right answer, okay? All right, so we're talking about bio uh, diversity and classification, which we kind of identified and introduced a little bit through that dichotomous key, branching key and dichotomous key activity from last week, and um, that uh, little snippet of reading in the front of the unit, uh, in the chapter of the book uh, last week as well, okay? So these are two species we have in Florida. We have the manatee. Um, which is a mammal, and we have this bird called a magnificent frigate bird. Uh, the males have these bright red pouches, obviously, that you see here, that they expand when uh, in the mating season, um, for an example. Pretty neat birds. We have them right here in Florida. So, um, the first thing we have to do in this unit is to be able to describe the classification of species into taxonomic hierarchies. And they are based upon domain, which we'll talk about all of these uh, throughout the next several weeks, okay? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, notice how genus is italicized and capital, and species. Notice how species is also italicized, but lowercase first letter, okay? So um, I will give you more specific examples of that in a moment. All right, so uh, physical characteristics. Do you remember when we were looking at our 10 animals, we were focusing on the physical characteristics of those creatures. Um, different domains we're going to talk about today are archaea or archaea bacteria, the archaea. Um, the U bacteria, which are your bacteria that probably you're from, most familiar with, the bacteria that's like on you and in you and on the tabletop and on your fingertips and things like that, okay? And then the eukaryotes. Um, and typically the domains separate those organisms that have nuclei, the eukaryotes, from the prokaryotes, the ones that don't have nuclei. And then the kingdoms are, there are six of them, the archaea bacteria, the eubacteria, the protista, which is where, um, and the fungi, which is where we're going to carry these notes today. This first section is going to focus on that. Then we get into, uh, oh, and, and, and uh, yeah, that's it. That's as far as we get today. Yes. And then we go into plantae or plants and animalia, which are all the fish and all the sponges and crabs and whales and all those things. Okay. So we're going to move our way up through that. You might remember some of this if you took biology class, um, but we're going to focus solely on the marine environment. Okay. And uh, the main difference between uh, the bacteria and the archaea bacteria is um, right, right here, okay? So um, if this is a chemical, uh, a uh, macromolecule, if you will, if you remember from biology class, that bacteria have, but the archaea do not. And um, the bacteria, the genes are different from eukaryotes like us. And in the archaea bacteria, the genes are more similar to the eukary eukaryote, okay? And then the archaea bacteria live in highly extreme environments. They're called extremophiles. So places that are like anoxic or high salinity or high temperature. That's an extremophile. So again, here's the hierarchy, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Here's an example, animalia. That's animals. Chordata, they have um, a spinal nerve cord. Vertebrata, they have bones, a vertebrate. 
Mammalia, they're mammals. Cetacea, they're whales. Odontoceti, they're toothed whales. Delphinidae, Orcanus, Orca. Their genus and species name. So that's their binomial nomenclature. Two name meaning. Binomial, two name nomenclature. Okay? Two name naming is what I meant to say. Two name naming. And that would give them their scientific name of Orcanus orca, otherwise known as the orca whale or the killer whale. But, and you're supposed to draw these in the box. So um, just quickly sketch these two orcas jumping out. They don't have to be an artwork. I'm going to change this very soon. But I wanted, you to point, I wanted to point out to you something very important while you're doing that. Notice how all these are just straight written. Okay, and then down here you get remaining to be capital but italicized, and then the first letter of the species and the remaining letters are all lowercase. And so when you type this, it's always italicized with the genus, capital, and the, and the species lowercase. When you write them, however, you can't discern between straight and italicized oftentimes in writing because people's handwriting is typically italicized, okay? So in writing, when handwriting, when you write the scientific name, you have to underline it. Of course, that's not here because we're not handwriting it on the screen, but when you write this, make sure that you underline it because that's the proper way, and it has to have a capital in the genus and a lowercase in the species. Here's two more examples. Um, so here's a tiger shark. You tiger sharks over there should appreciate this. Um, going down the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, until you get to the scientific name, the binomial nomenclature, capital G, lowercase c, italicized because it's typed. And over here we have the crown of thorns, sea star, which we'll talk about all these creatures later. Again, this is how they are classified. And, um, and then capital A, acanthaster, plank eye, okay? With a little lowercase p. So that's how you do it. And if these were handwritten, remember they're underlined because you can't italicize when you hand write things. Now, we're not gonna do this right here. You're gonna do this later. So. Um, but this is a little more practice for the dichotomous key because it is one of the um, standards that you have to know for this unit. So we, I'll do the first one with you, remember? So we'll start with this flat fish, all right? If the fish shape is long and skinny, if it's not long and skinny, so that's not long and skinny, so we're gonna go to step three. Fish has both eyes on top of the head, Fish has one eye on each side of the head. So both eyes are on top of its head. I know it's hard to see, but it is. So go to four. Fish has a long whip-like tail, does not. Fish has a short blunt-like tail. It's a peacock flounder. And so down here in your box on your notes, you will write one peacock flounder, and then you're gonna do the rest. Okay, and I'm gonna be checking that when you submit these on Google Classroom. We're not waiting until this entire unit is done with these notes, just so you know. Um, we are turning these in as individual unit, individual parts of unit four. So this is part one. You will turn in part one. It's the first time we've done this all year, okay? Okay, so we are going to study and we're going to make observations and drawings from unfamiliar structures or specimens, which we're going to learn. Most of these are going to be unfamiliar or at least truly unfamiliar. Yeah, I know that's a fish, Mr. Keen, but what kind of fish? I know that's a, a whale. What kind of whale? I know that's a sponge, but what kind of sponge? Okay, so that's the unfamiliarity part. So we're going to be learning about phytoplankton, zooplankton, echinoderms, or echinodermata, that means spiny skin, crustaceans, bony fishes, cartilaginous fishes, macroalgae, seaweed, and marine plants, as well as marine mammals 
and I might even throw marine birds in there too. We'll see. We'll see where this goes, okay? So, um, because I think it's all one encompassing picture and you should know at least a representation from each phylum, or not phylum, but um, class. So, like class aves, you know, um, rep reptiles and all that stuff, okay? So we're gonna be talking about all this. But first, we have to start at the bottom. And I mean like literally the bottom. Detritus. These organisms, these bacteria thrive in detritus, um, which is organic dead matter at the bottom of the sea. You can also have forest detritus at the bottom of the forest. It's all the leaves and broken up pieces of dead critters and things all at the bottom. Um, but bacteria are prokaryotes. Remember, prokaryotes have no nucleus. That should be very clear to you from biology class. They are come in all different shapes, spheres, rods, spirals, rings. You can see some of them in these pictures and uh, where they're from. So um, these are from the Baltic Sea, from the North Sea, the Pacific sediment. Many of them are decay bacteria. It means they break down products. They're part of the nitrogen cycle in the whole cycle of life. These are the most abundant life forms on the planet. There's no other life form that outnumbers bacteria. And they're found in every single marine environment you could possibly think of. As a matter of fact, if they weren't found, the marine environment would probably be dead because they oftentimes form a very key role in that whole food web, okay? And I, I skipped this, they're very, they're small in comparison to um, eukaryotes. So you may have <clears throat> one eukaryotic cell which could be the size of this, like one of our cells, okay? It could be at the size of this bottle. And a bacteria would be like the size of a period at the end of the sentence. So something compared to this. So you, you can imagine how many bacteria you could have on the surface of this one larger cell. Very tiny critters. And here's the generalized body plan for bacteria. We're gonna be folk, uh, working on something like this tomorrow. So um, I'll give you more specifics about this and why the parts that we need to fill out. But for now, just take a gander at it, okay? Okay, so different kinds of bacteria. We have heterotrophic bacteria. Remember what the heterotrophs do. Heterotrophs obtain energy from other organisms. Heterotrophs, hetero means different. So they're going to need energy from a different source other than themselves. Most of them are decomposers or DK bacteria. They recycle nutrients for the base of the food chain. That's like I said before, if there were no bacteria, the ecosystem is probably dead. There's nothing alive at all. And that would be like at a nuclear bomb site or something like that, okay? Or on the surface of the moon. Um, and of course, well, that's a necessary inhabitants for our classroom tanks. We don't have any classroom tanks. Um, I thought I deleted that, but oh well. Years ago, um, I had some classroom fish tanks in, in the classroom. But. And this is some examples, nitrosomus, nitrobacter, okay? Um, and then we have an autotrophic bacteria. Just like autotrophic plants or you know, organisms like that, auto means self. So these are gonna make their own food by either being photosynthetic or chemosynthetic. Here are some uh, purple sulfur bacteria that are autotrophic. They make their own food just like green plants do using sunlight. And here's some uh, hydrothermal vent bacteria that are chemosynthetic. And of course, they don't derive their energy from the sun, they derive their energy from chemical compounds. Examples are hydrogen sulfide, uh, sulfur and iron, or methane, which is natural gas, CH4. And you're gonna find all those raw materials for them to process um, and get energy for the basis of the food chain at um, deep sea thermal, hydrothermal vents, okay? And then we have these cyanobacteria. They're also called blue-green algae. So they are photosynthetic, which means they're autotrophic, right? Um, so these are some of the oldest organisms to exist on Earth. 
They have been around for billions, that's right, with a B, billions of years, um, more than three billion years. So um, they're probably, probably the first photosynthetic organisms on Earth. They played an important role in producing oxygen in the atmosphere for the rest of the critters to evolve in. Now, uh, some of them are still existing today, but we've, we have found fossils of stromatolites. For example, these are found in the Grand Canyon. Um, but these are ones that are still alive and growing today. What they do is they essentially make rock structures in colonial form. And um, massive calcareous mounds formed by these cyanobacteria. And these are ones that are in Shark Bay, Australia, protected environments, not allowed to even like go there without a permit, scientific permit, because they're so rare and they're so useful in studying uh, evolution and how life became, you know, to be on the planet. And these are ones that are in the Bahamas, which are only, the Bahamas are 60 miles that way. They're right there, okay? Um, so these, these exist there as well. But they're very rare and very neat. Cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. Then we have the archaeobacteria. Very simple, very primitive. Um, these also are some of the, or similar to some of the oldest fossils ever found on the planet, over three billion years old. They come in different shapes, and they're more closely related to eukaryotic cells, like, like our cells, than the other bacteria. And of course, some of them are extremophiles, which we mentioned before, and they live by uh, hydrothermal vents. And here's a, a hydrothermal vent, a, otherwise known as a, a black smoker. And these, this white looks like snow. That is actually mats of this bacteria growing there, and again, forming the basis of the food chain. So these have uh, lots of flagella, and um, these are some that thrive in temperatures of around 100 degrees Celsius, so boiling point of water, which would kill most other things. All right, so we're moving on from the bacteria to something called plankton, and there are different kinds of plankton. Here you can see all different kinds of plankton, even that organism right there, the mola mola. Um, yes, I said mola mola. So M-O-L-A-M-O-L-A, -L -A -L -A, also known as the, sun, the um, ocean sunfish. I write it down, but mola mola is very easy to spell. Write it down right now in your notes. M-O-L-A-M-O-L-A, -L -A -L -A. that's a scientific name, so when you're writing it, make sure you follow the rules when you're writing it, okay? The capitals and the lower cases and the underlines and that kind of stuff, remember that, okay? So planktons are, plankton are defined as any organism that cannot swim against the current. They are drifters, floaters, weak swimmers. That's why mola mola are considered planktonic because their, their, their fins here, their pectoral fins are so small that they, don't, they can't swim against the current. They just go where the tide takes them. And these are, these are just stabilizers. They can't even really do anything with those. Um, very strange creature. So phytoplankton are photosynthetic. There are some bacteria, we talked about that already, but definitely algae. And then those are your plant-like plankton, plant-like. And zooplankton, the key word here is zoo, animals, right? These are your animal-like plankton. So they could be single-celled, unicellular organisms, or they can be larvae, tiny, immature, stages of everything from corals to oysters to fish and shrimp and crabs um, spend that only a partial part of their life cycle in the planktonic form and then they settle down or, or grow big enough to swim. And then all of these spend their entire life cycle. Jellyfish like the um, Portuguese man of war, Physalia Physalia is a scientific name for that guy. Uh, copepods and krill, Algae, here's a, a larval form of a fish. So anything that is defined here is considered planktonic. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about um, one particular kind of protist, protista, kingdom protista. 
or plankton, the phytoplankton, the plant-like protists, multicellular or unicellular, I should say, algae, unicellular, one cell. They are shallow water. Why? Because of sunlight. We know that. Okay. They're using uh, carbon dioxide and water to produce glucose and sugar. And they absorb nutrients from their environment. So magnesium to make chlorophyll, um, nitrates to make proteins and DNA, phosphates to make ATP and cell membranes, as well as DNA. And then some of them need silicate, um, which is essentially glass. They make their shells out of glass, or their shells are glass. And I'll show you what those are in a minute. Diatoms. Uh, that's what diatoms, and then make some of them make their shells out of calcium carbonate, which or calcium, which they pull out of the water. They pull all this stuff out of the water, and those are called coccolithophores. It's a funny name, coccolithophores. I'll show you one of those in a little while. To produce their skeletons, and this is some from uh, grown from the water surrounding Antarctica. So algae is everywhere. Again, it makes kind of the basis of the food chain in many places. Very diverse all photosynthetic, mostly aquatic. That means it could be fresh water or salt water. They're eukaryotic, so they do have a nucleus. They have chloroplasts, and they could be of three different colors, green, brown, or red. And they don't lack, and they don't have, they lack any true leaves, stems, or roots. They don't have any of those normal plant-like organs that you would, you know, think of when you think of a photosynthetic plant thing. So these are all single cells. So these, they're very unique. There's so many of them, they're almost like snowflakes, um, but it, it's species related. So these are all different species. These aren't the same species. Um, so diatoms are the ones that make their shells out of glass and silica, a glass-like material. And their shells are essentially cell walls because they're single-celled organisms, right? So it's called a frustule. Sounds like frustrated, but frustule, okay? And that's what their um, skeletons are, their cell walls. And when they settle to the bottom, they can form these thick, gooey deposits, almost like a mucky, sticky mud. It's kind of weird stuff. But anyway, um, it's of silicious material called diatomaceous ooze. It's called ooze. That name is kind of gross, like something oozing out of something, but that's what it's called. You're going to see multiple of these organisms. When they die and settle to the bottom, they form these different kinds of oozes. Now, eventually, it gets covered with sediment. And over many, you know, millions of years, it turns into sedimentary rock. And that rock is called diatomaceous earth. Now, if you have a pool at your house, you might know what this stuff is because you have to put it in the pool filter. Um, so you can find them in pool filters, silver polish, road paint to make it like gritty and traction, to have traction, and even toothpaste. You have brushed your teeth with diatomaceous earth, with organisms that are in um, unicellular phytoplankton. Here's some more about them. So they are yellow to brown color because they have this pigment called carotenoids. It's the same pigment that gives carrots their orange color. 6,000 species total, uh, 12,000 in the world. So that means the rest of them are freshwater, about half of them. Some are sessile. That word is important. We're gonna be uh, talking about that word more in the future. Sessile means does not move. It's the opposite of motile. Motile, like something is moving around, can move from point A to point B. Sessile creatures cannot, like barnacles are sessile, unless they're on the back of a turtle or a whale or something. They reproduce asexually, so that means that their cells split via meios uh, mitosis. Um, they don't, there's no sperm or egg because that would be a cell, another cell, right? Favorable conditions called, uh, cause blooms. So when there's too much nitrogen or fertilizer, you know, from land pouring into the water, um, it can cause them to, to grow too wildly and uh, give them rapid periods of reproduction. And this is what it does to the water. Some of them produce uh, toxic materials that come out and kill fish and even manatees. So the next phytoplankton, marine algae, are the dinoflagellates. 
they're again unicellular. Their word, their name means two flagella. So they have these flagella that come out of these grooves on the side of their cell wall, okay? And they have these armored plates. This is a coccolithophore, by the way. Um, and the plates might have spines or not, pores and other ornamentation. So they protect themselves. It's, it's one cell. It's a relatively big cell, but still one cell. No organs, just organelles like the nucleus and the Golgi body and the endoplasmic reticulum and things like that. Um, but it's, it's an armored cell. It's really kind of cool. And they use um, cellulose. They're cellulose plates. So that's lots, that's like sheets of glucose molecules all connected together. This paper you're writing on is cellulose. And now we're going to move on from the phytoplankton, the photosynthetic algae, you know, uh, microorganisms, to the protozoans. These are your zooplankton. These are your animal-like um, unicellular plankton, okay? Um, and they're heterotrophic, so that means they have to get their food from something else. We talked about that before. They're eukaryotic, so remember that means that they have a nucleus as opposed to bacteria, which are prokaryotic. And there's roughly, we haven't discovered them all yet, 50,000 species give or take, and we're discovering more and more. They're so tiny, we find them in all these unique environments and they're new ones. These are really cool. These are quite amazing. When you zoom in on them, this is what they, when you magnify, these are the exoskeletons of a marine protozoa found on the beach in Okin Okinawa, Japan, that lived on the ocean floor 550 million years ago. And these are all just a whole bunch of different kinds. You can just scoop up sand at the beach and look at it microscopically, and you will find these things, if you have a good enough eye, you know, microscope. So the first kind we're going to talk about, remember, these are animal-like, they're zooplankton. Um, these are called um, foraminiferans. They have a test, a test is a shell. It's another name for a shell, okay? So these are tests, 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 okay? Um, and they're made of calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate. And they have these pseudopodia, pseudopods, that come out. These long extensions are little grasping like tentacles almost that stick out of the test, the shell, to trap food. Diatoms, they eat diatoms, okay? They eat phytoplankton. The zooplankton eat phytoplankton. We've seen that in our food chains and our food webs before. Most of them live on the bottom, free or attached. Some species are planktonic. Um, and they can, when they die and settle to the bottom, they don't form uh, the other kind of ooze. They form foraminiferin ooze. And so these guys, these are actually, these are huge foraminiferins. Their, their tests are uniquely shaped, obviously, but they're a millimeter long. So if you look at a centimeter, 10 of these lined up would make one centimeter, which is about a third of an inch. So, so you could fit like 10 of them in a third of an inch. So they're pretty big for single cell you, you know, organisms. And this is a very famous example of what can happen over you know, many, many millions of years. They, they create limestone and chalk deposits. And this is the White Cliffs of Dover in England. You may have seen this in movies and videos or whatever, okay? Um, and it's, so here's England, um, London, and right there on the bottom, lower east, southeast are the White Cliffs of Dover, right there. And then France would be over here, okay? <clears throat> the radiolarians are next. Don't worry about what phylum they're in. Um, that's in your notes, but you're not going to be tested on that. They have also, these are now, these are animal-like protists that 
also make their shells out of glass, silicon dioxide, silica. And they have um, radiating spines like this. They also have pseudopods to capture food. Some form colonies reaching three meters in length. It's pretty wild. And when they settle to the bottom, they make an ooze as well, called radiolarian ooze. This is actually a live radiolarian, and these are um, tests of different, different species of radiolarian. <clears throat> Pretty wicked stuff. All right, here, and this is like different, look at this, these are like drawings from people many years ago who drew them this is, this is like your classic example of some pretty major detailed scientific illustration here. And look at the, it's amazing. It looks like, how can nature make these? It looks like some kind of weird helmet from Genghis Khan or something like that, right? Like the eyes would be behind there. And this is like the, just, but these are living creatures. These are their, their unicellular skeletons. I mean, look at that thing. It's just incredible. And then we have the ciliates. Um, many hair-like cilia are used to move around and feed. Many species are found, um, well not many, marine species I should say, are found on or near the bottom of the ocean. And some of them are symbiotic, living with other organisms. So these little cilia, they beat like, um, like little oars, like a whole bunch of oars on like one of those old Roman or Greek boats and they move around. You may know what a paramecium is. Very similar. And then finally we have the fungi, the fungi, the funguses. They are eukaryotic, eukaryotic, so that means that their cells have nuclei. They're heterotrophic, which means they eat other things. Um, most of them, virtually all of them, are decomposers, so they decompose dead matter. There are over 500 species, and some of them are parasitic. So some of them will um, infect fish species or other species. An example, um, if you are a poor angler, I don't mean that you're a fisherman or fisher person who doesn't have any money. I mean that your practices are bad, okay? Here's an example. Um, when I lived in Tampa, I knew um, a lot more about Tampa Bay than most people because I taught marine science over there in, in that part of the state. But there's a fish called um, redfish that live in Tampa Bay. And they're protected. You, can, you, know, you have to have certain, you can only get a certain size and they're tagged. They actually put tags on the fish. Well, if you pick up a fish with dry hands, you will stick to the fish's mucus coating on the outside of its body, or scales, and peel off that mucus coating. If you've ever touched a fish, you know the fish are slimy because they have a mucus coating on the outside of their, of their body, of their scales. So a fish was found with a human handprint on its body of fungus because they touched the fish, they caught the fish, they put it in the boat, and they didn't wet their hands first. You have to wet your hands before you touch any fish. If you're, unless you're gonna eat it, who cares? Then you throw it in your bucket and you bring it home and you eat it. But if you're gonna throw it back, you have to be really careful. You have to you have, be smart. And you have to wet your hands first because they touched the fish and they peeled off all of the protective mucus in a handprint. And then this parasitic fungus came in and grew where the, where the missing mucus was and made a, a black handprint on the fish's side. So that's what I mean by being a poor angler, a poor angling practices, okay? Now some uh, funguses, fungi, are symbiotic with algae, not parasitic, symbiotic, right? Remember the, you had symbiosis, which could take place as mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism, right? So lichens, you can see lichens here on campus. I could show you right outside the door probably there's some growing on an oak tree out there or something. Um, but they also grow on the rocks. 
on rocky shores and they, uh, the fungus will form a relationship with the algae and make these things called lichens. And that's cold water only. We don't have those here. We have terrestrial uh, lichens, but not um, marine lichens here in Florida. Okay, so that's your notes. Make sure that you um, get everything down. Go back and uh, finish slide five, the di um, dichotomous key. And if you also didn't finish or you wanted to add something to your orca whales jumping out of the water on page one, you can do that now as well in class. Um, you could also work on your folder, your field guide folder, because we do have time.